Welcome back to episode three of In Conversation With, and I'm joined tonight by the lovely Philosophy on Ice. Hi there. Hello. It's uh, great to have you on the show. Oh, it's good. It's good to be on the show. I've been a big fan of the show ever since I heard that one episode. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, well, we're here tonight to talk about skepticism and the philosophical method, sort of where it comes from and why the philosophical method and the scientific method is good for learning about the world. So I think you wanted to start off by saying a bit about Socrates. Yeah, I think Socrates is a good starting point for like uh, skepticism, uh, in my view. Well, I don't think he was considered a skeptic. I don't really know why, but from what I know of him, I think he's a good starting point. So obviously, he's an ancient Greek. Yeah often considered like the father of philosophy I think it was partly because of his sort of uh, method of inquiry which was to to sort of doubt so he was this sort of uh, bizarre sort of character who meandered the the streets of Athens and yeah yeah <laughs> um, what he tended to do was bring people into conversation um, and question them on different uh, philosophical ideas so um things like virtue or courage uh, and these sorts of things and he would ask them what they thought they knew about it and then sort of slowly break down the idea of what that is he would essentially usually draw the conclusion that it isn't quite what they thought um, and that's in essence the Socratic method um, and yeah so kind of reading he had a variety of different uh, books which are written by Plato and uh, essentially they they provide a good catalogue of of sort of doubt um, towards different ideas in life. Yeah, because Socrates of course famously uh, thought that he knew nothing and I suppose the only thing, the only place you can go from there is to, to ask questions and to, to doubt what other people are saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the idea of him knowing nothing comes from um, the re it's, it's the result of this questioning, this sort of questioning method in the first place. So, um, I think the story goes that one of his one of his mates, <laughs> one of his Greek mates, um, goes to speak to the oracle. I don't really know what an oracle does to this day. I don't really know what an oracle is supposed to do. But he asks the oracle. Is there any person who's smarter than Socrates? And the oracle says, no. And he goes back to Socrates and tells him what the oracle said. And it confuses him. He's like, well, I don't feel like I know anything. So, Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a funny thing to say. Because you'd think that the, the Greeks prizing, you know, intelligence and, and wisdom and knowledge above all else. is It must have been shocking to them for the oracle to say, you know, this, this man... He's, he's the smartest person around because he knows nothing. That's quite a weird thing to say. Yeah. What's, what's the quote again? It's something like... A wise man knows he knows nothing at all. That's right, yeah. And you conclude yeah. he was smarter than others because they thought that they knew the, what things like virtue and courage uh, were. But he knew that they, like, they, these supposed experts didn't know anything. Yeah. I think that was, that was the point of it. I think he, he knew enough at least to uh, push people he was talking to into a corner with their uh, with their arguments anyway. Yeah, he, I think he was known as being a right sarky bastard. Yeah, I think one of my favourite <laughs> one of my favourite stories about Socrates is when he was held on trial for uh, the corruption of the youth of Athens. And they said to him something along the lines of, well, what do you think your punishment should be? You know, what, what's fair for your crimes? And he said free maintenance from the state <laughs> so they, they should pay because he thought he was doing the state a service That's but they right, um, yeah. they weren't having none of it they thought oh you're such a sarky bitch and they gave him a uh, hemlock and he just drank it <laughs> actually that isn't the entire story he, he did suggest no. that but um, strangely 
back then you could suggest your own punishment, which and and mm. that was his suggestion. But then he, uh, the best he could go for was to say, okay, I'll take a small fine then, which I think is even <laughs> more ridiculous. He's like, charge me like a hundred quid and we'll call this quits. Yeah. Like, no, we'll put you to death, Socrates. Oh Cheeky well. Bastard. <laughs> and he he was a drunk as well, so I quite admire that. Was Socrates. he? I didn't know that. He was a, he could drink gallons of booze, and he was a fat guy. Or suppose, well, I don't know. Whenever you look at like portrayals of Socrates as a statue, he's always a tubby bastard, isn't he? I wasn't aware of that. That's well, quite funny. Uh, yeah, have, have a look. If you go on Google, it, people always portray him as some big, fat, hairy bloke. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's just that that's the way it's gone <laughs> over time, but... Yeah. Well, I mean, if he wasn't the um, the gold standard for fitness, shall we say, he definitely was for um, learning about the world and questioning things and how to have a... Uh, a good conversation yeah. uh, and I think that's something that can be brought across to today because I don't know I think we tend to take for granted today that we we know a lot of stuff and we can know it with certainty but you know if Socrates was alive today I think he'd he'd have some things to say about that yeah yeah there was a quite a large period between Socrates and anyone else I know who who spoke of sort of sceptical ideas a good solid like fifteen hundred twenty like two thousand years. <laughs> yeah. What was that? What was that period of like time where there was just like no philosophers, no well, famous that was the, ones. That was the um. What was that, was that? They were the Christian times, weren't they? Oh, <laughs> you listen, is that what it you is? listen to the church, and that was that. That's what I imagine anyway. It was it was yeah. up to the um up to the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, wasn't it? That's that's it, isn't it? That's so true. Yeah, I never thought of that. Mm. I mean, there there are. I mean, I've looked I've looked them up and. There's a bunch of philosophers who I've never heard of, but because um, they were sort of um, the the Christians at the time, they were quite afraid of the Greeks because they thought like, oh shit, here's some people that started questioning, you know, the stuff that was handed to them, the knowledge that was supposed to be certain. Mm, so mm. if you're part of the church, that's a risk because you can't have the people questioning what you say, and that's why I think a lot of the uh, the praise through time goes to people like uh, Thomas Aquinas. I mean, he's a saint, isn't he? Because he... Um, I think it was Aquinas. There's another guy as well. I can't remember his name. Yeah, I don't know much about him, yeah. Uh, he... Um, but th they were caught sort of revered for um, combining Christian theology and, and Greek philosophy in, in a way that it could work together. So they, they didn't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, I see, I see. Oh, your, ex your knowledge on this is good. Don't don't press me any deeper because it only runs <laughs> <laughs> it only runs so far. Um, I, I listened to your last podcast and I was quite impressed with the sort of range of uh, knowledge that both you and Exerbia had of like ancient and contemporary ideas. Yeah, mine's it's, littered uh, with random ideas, but it's not a particularly full sort of catalogue well, of ideas. It's there. sometimes the best way to be. I wouldn't describe myself as having a full catalogue of ideas at any means, but. Um, <laughs> It's good enough for a chat anyway. And that's what yeah. we're here for. <laughs> that's all we're here for, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. This is why I like philosophy anyway. It's just chatting with people like you, talking through different ideas. And uh, there's there's many, many people who've had smarter ideas than us, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Who uh, have just got lost in the sand of time that, we never heard, that we'll never hear of. But uh, yeah, that's why I quite like it. But yeah, I mean, should we move on to something else? Yeah. So... Um... We'll move forward. We've talked a bit about Socrates as sort of the um, the archetypal foundational figure for uh, scepticism in philosophy. Um, he's not really known as that, but that's... No, he's not known as that. I think he should be, though. Yeah, it's, it's mean, his sort of like method of doubting, which really, I think, is, is a great starting point for just breaking down different arguments, breaking down different ideas of what it is to be, you know, certain things. I think... Um, yeah. later translates into more solid sceptical ideas. Perhaps. Yeah, because there's definitely, you know, stuff we take for granted today that rely upon this whole sort of subset of foundational assumptions that we just tend to assume are true and we just take it as granted that they're true. But, you know, a little poking around, a little questioning, and they, they come up as they're not so certain as we think. And I mean, this was, um, I suppose we should move on to Descartes, um, this is one of the things that he was worried about because he he was there during the the Renaissance, the Enlightenment era. Yeah. And uh, 
he, he sort of came from the um what's it called the scholastic tradition he was he was raised in the scholastic tradition and he just kind of learned all this stuff and accepted it and he he, he thought that um in order to get a good grounding in the sciences that you needed a um you know a good philosophical underpinning so you can know yeah. that what you're discovering is true and uh he painted a great picture i think it's in his his meditations or the discourse on method one of the two of the um the tree of knowledge so he's got um sort of the branches of the tree are sort of you know chemistry and, and biology the trunk of the tree is is physics yeah. and then you've got the roots of the tree is is metaphysics it's, it's the philosophical stuff yeah. and i mean it's true when you think about it without any sort of metaphysical grounding then the sciences can't really do much yeah, f- philosophy's still got its uses after all this time because there's a lot of things that science can't sort of deal with and like those yeah. sort of metaphysics of knowledge. It does, it, there's a lot of crossover with that sort of science, that science um, kind of area. But there was a, um, there was a lecture that I had um, this year and it was on, I can't remember the exact name of it, but there were, there were a series of lectures discussing whether philosophy should be viewed as continuous or discontinuous with science whether it's its own sort of separate thing whether it should be oh, lumped off in the humanities and everything yeah. and one of the definitions that I really liked personally was that philosophy is the midwife of science so it sort of it gives birth to it it, it, it sort of generates the ideas and, and refines them to a degree in which it can <laughs> then you know <laughs> branch off to science and then science can do its thing so science is sort of at like the bleeding edge of sorry philosophy sort of at the bleeding edge and when it gets sort of resolved enough then it can become science and i really like that view mm, yeah i really don't think it's fair when people say um you know scientists say oh we've got no use for philosophy you know science can do it all and i'm like really it's like it can't do everything without a, a good philosophical in science yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah there's a lot of the, gaps yeah i think is i think because there's such a variety of different and really really differing ideas in philosophy and they can't all be right, and um, so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily trust in certain philosophical ideas, but it is an alternative. It, it kind of fills in the gaps that science uh, has for now, sort of thing. Yeah, it's an antiquated way of of looking at life, really. I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, there is something to be said for how long-standing philosophy has been through time, and how important it's been. Because I mean, in in the beginning especially in the ancient times, um, even up to, I think it was only in the 17th century that science as its own discipline started to become a thing. It was, it was natural philosophy before that. Yeah, that's true. And it's been this that's massive true. generator of knowledge throughout time. And it's, it's shown itself again and again, like, yeah, the caricature still stands, you know, there's arguments throughout thousands of years and they never get resolved. Um, mm. but the, the point still remains, I think once they do get resolved and it's then that, science can can then take hold of it and actually do something with it and i like that um description particularly because it explains the apparent lack of progress in philosophy you know because if as soon as something becomes resolved enough that it becomes science then it then it would seem like philosophy doesn't make any progress because it it doesn't science makes all the progress and Mm. you know fair enough science should get a lot of praise for what it does it's been a tremendous generator of knowledge for um hundreds of years and we're in a place currently where it's uh there's loads of stuff that we wouldn't know i mean look at the you know we've got um satellites leaving the solar system nowadays or leaving the they've gone further than that haven't they (laughs) i don't know they've gone really far i mean you know there's there's satellites on mars and there's all these amazing technological advances that we have that we wouldn't have if it were just science you know philosophy couldn't philosophy can't make a an iPhone can it but <laughs> yeah yeah um, I suppose as well it's this is why this kind of highlights how important certain ideas throughout the last say 3,000 years have been so for instance Descartes like we were saying mm. you know it's a long time <laughs> uh, when was he around that was uh, fifth, 16th century wasn't he mid 16th something like that 16th or 17th something like that yeah, and his his ideas obviously the the Kagito has has really stood the test of time, mm. um, or you know not all of his ideas obviously have, but um, certain parts which are which are 
you know, can we call it genius? I don't know. Well, he was we he was that? certainly he was probably I I mean if we can call Socrates the father of philosophy, we can call Descartes the father of science, definitely. Oh, I've not heard that about him before. Is that, you do you definitely... make that understand or is that No, I'm I'm not that original. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, heard it somewhere. From it? I do like that yeah I, do I don't like know that. I've heard it somewhere but he definitely he sort of you know made massive leaps forward for certainly the modern era we wouldn't be anywhere without him I don't think yeah or at least not yeah, as far as they are yeah the enlightenment kind yeah of era, isn't it? but it's I mean we, we were gonna we were gonna go on to talk about Descartes got a bit off track yeah um, go on so like yeah what's yeah so let's highlight let's talk some about of his it. ideas and then we can yeah so like like Socrates, um, Descartes worked with um, doubt in particular. That was his main tool. And his yeah. his first sort of wave of doubt of the three was um, how can we be sure that our senses are telling us the truth? And mm-hmm. it's it's true when you think about it. I mean, we tend to you know a lot of things when they pop into our heads, we just assume they're true. Um, you know, I assume that I'm seeing you with my eyes and that's just they're just telling the truth and I'm, I'm I'm hearing things accurately um but when you think about it you know even just a little bit it, it, it sort of falls apart because we have optical illusions you know the classic um or in the water you know it looks bent it looks misshapen um, well there's the facts that we're talking right now with a computer so we're not actually in front of each other mm. and given given the right technology we could sort of create the the impression that we are in front of each other, you know? So like, yeah. you know, VR and stuff, for instance, in the future. Yeah. But um, it's Just definitely an <laughs> not an easy thing to say that we're perceiving the truth all the time. Mm. And and that was his... Um, that was his first wave of doubt. Anyway, that was on the first page of the meditations. Um, how do we know? <laughs> it's a... It's a this, is, this is somewhat... I was I would call this local skepticism at the minute. He does go on to bigger, more global skepticism. Yeah. But um yeah, it is true. I mean there's a variety of optical illusions and that that we come across, you know, the classic ones on the internet. And um if we can be sure or or relatively certain in that instance that our senses are deceiving us, then how do we know our senses aren't deceiving us all the time? Yeah. And it can be uh worrying <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Um, did he have a proof for that? Uh, no. So his his method. What was his get out for that? So his method, because he wanted to find certainty in the sciences. That was his goal at the start of the meditation. So he wanted to make yeah. sure that the sciences were certain. And so what he said was, right. If I can doubt anything just a little bit, then it, then it has to go. I have to assume it's false because that's not going to be a good foundation for truth. Mm. Um, and because we can think of instances, you know, little instances in our day to day lives where our senses do deceive us, then then we have to assume that they're deceiving us all the time. Like, how do we know that the world, because cause we live in our senses, all we have is our senses and we're directly acquainted with what our um, our eyes and ears and our, our mouth and everything tell us is the case. Um, we don't have anything else beyond that. We don't have direct access to the external world. So how do we know that the external world is anything like what we perceive it to be. Yeah. I That's... think that that question can still stand. I don't think um you know, there's 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 a certain restricted way of viewing the world that we have and that is through our senses and you know, um in certain dimensions. Um and I don't know is that resolvable? I don't know. I don't I, I, it's well, kind of a very uh, a narrow and kind of um, one-dimensional view of the well, three-dimensional view of the world <laughs> yeah. to uh, to to assume that this is this is all there is, and uh, because this is this is all we experience, no one ever really considers other other uh, means of experience. If you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. I mean, we we can only experience the world in three dimensions. Um, it's highly unlikely that the universe out there exists in three dimensions I mean look at super string theory and that it something like 12 dimensions isn't it that posits there could be so yeah. many more that we're just not experiencing so I think uh, in light of that argument it's really hard to assume that what we perceive is the truth 
it's it's easier yeah. to um it's yeah. easier to be skeptical about it than to just write it off as just another stupid um overthinking yeah i mean you know uh, it, in, in very recent history they've discovered that you know new fields like the electro the um sorry the uh electromagnetic field or the uh, gravitational field and there's who's to say there aren't various other fields which we're not currently aware of which yeah. are affecting us in certain different ways you know um it's getting a bit it's getting a bit uh woo woo from me a bit now but yeah <laughs> um but you know that it's, it's it's true you know it's uh it's it's this is what skepticism is it's, it's about doubting it's about um sort of removing certain assertions you have about the world yeah um and I think, just from my memory, there were two responses, two main responses to this from John Locke. And the first one was that um, our senses are involuntary. We don't choose what we perceive. It just it happens to us. You know, we don't have any... I, ca I can't suddenly imagine that I'm perceiving the world a different way. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. So that's sort of strong evidence that there is something out there that's the cause of our perceptions. I suppose because we can only work within the confines of how we're built and what's around us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other, the other main skepticism sort of related to that was um, how can we be sure that we're not just imagining things? You know, it's sort of going off that response. And John Locke, it's one of my favourite responses ever. He says, um, you know, it's it's one thing to imagine uh, the heat of a fire; it's another thing to stick your hand in it. <laughs> you know. So yeah. th there's some sort of evidence um, <laughs> that there's something out there um, besides from what's just in our heads. Um, and I think it's reasonably... It's not easy to write off, but it's reasonably safe to assume that there is something out there, given that um, me and you could both agree on something. You know, there's a table there, and we could both agree on that, and we could, we could measure it, and we'd come up with the same measurements. Um, it's reasonably secure. Yeah, me measurements within within our sort of the world that we perceive, I suppose, the the three dimensional yeah. world that we perceive. Yeah, uh, but then again, coming coming off that again, the um, the whole qualia debate, the inverted qualia. Um, you know, if you're looking at the sky and you perceive it as blue, and I say, oh yeah, the sky is blue, but I'm actually seeing it's red in 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 yeah. my head. This, and, as far as I understand, isn't something that you can that you can resolve either. There's there's no way of me being able to tell if you're seeing the same thing as me. Is that right? Yeah, because qualia, or as they're currently understood, are inherently private things, and yeah. I don't have access to your qualia. You don't have access to mine, yeah. and it seems like something, at least in in that regard, that's quite irresolvable. True. There is there is certain intuitions that we have though, for example, pleasure and pain and, and these sorts of things, I guess. So mm. you know, it would it our intuitions suggest that what I feel as pain isn't isn't what you feel as pleasure and vice versa. I yeah. Guess. We can we can make you know, sort of um by the way we behave and Yeah, like by analogy from us from our own cases, I can assume that if you're, you know, screaming, lying on the ground, bleeding, then <laughs> you're probably in, <laughs> in pain um, yeah, yeah I think it, that's one of the things that can be reasonably secure um, but then to return to Descartes he goes on from that mm. to his um, to his second wave and he says okay we can't be certain that the senses aren't telling us the truth um, but how do we know that we're not dreaming all the time yeah um, and, and the classic response to that is well you know you're in a dream because when you wake up from a dream, you know it's it has been a dream and it's not been real. Yeah. Um, but that does nothing for the fact that we might be in a dream right now. Yeah. Um, and that's a sort that's of step always up. fascinated me. And yeah. again, something I haven't quite sort of fully figured out per on a personal level. Mm. It's um, yeah, it's pretty scary. It's a scary I don't, prospect. I don't, yeah, I mean, it's scary in that we feel secure and, and comfortable and safe in our own in our own kind of world but it's that kind of inception idea isn't it it's, you know have you seen that yeah yeah it's top film and it's yeah. um can't say i understood it but oh i fucking loved it um yeah i do you know what i actually um 
I read a tweet the other day. Yeah. Which uh, <laughs> tweets don't usually hold valuable philosophical information, I must say. But yeah. this one was particularly good. It said something like, um, "Imagine if when you die, you um, open your eyes and there's a bong in your hand, <laughs> and you look up and your alien friend says." How was it? <laughs> <laughs> and I just think, Christ, yeah, like, there's no reason why that couldn't be, that couldn't happen, you know? It yeah. Could just be, this, this could just be a big trip, a big, uh, yeah. you know? Th- there was something I saw sort of similar to that, um, a bit more darker than that, but it was, uh, you sort of, you die, and then you wake up from whatever it is in, in the hereafter, and, uh, Satan comes up to you and he says, "Oh, how was your first torture session?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, that's that that would <laughs> that would be somewhat else that would." Yeah, oh. I mean, if 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 you if you really start kind of think thinking about sort of what this world provides for us in terms of you know suffering and balanced out by the amount of joy, I think. The, this this place is kind of a lot more in the in the realms of hell than it would be heaven mm. if you can define if you can define either of those things <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean of course there's been a lot of work done on that theologically through the ages mm. um the one i most like is um it's called the the soul making theodicy by john Ooh. hick Ooh. and uh a theodicy is just any attempt to reconcile the existence of a good God with the amount of suffering that's in the world. Yes. And his argument was that, so the world, we come into the world and the world is, is broken because of, you know, because of the fall and, and all the events that led up to it. Um, and we're supposed to, we're here, it's the world he defines as the, the veil of soul making. And, and we're here to kind of test our souls and, and, and build up, uh, our sort of resistance to these things and and he says that you know we're not God's little pets to be put in this kind of luxury you know cage and everything for his amusement we're here to we're here for a reason you know we're here to um to grow spiritually and, right. and, and morally um and that's my my favorite attempt to reconcile the existence of a good God with the amount of suffering I mean there is there is a lot of suffering you'll um I'm writing a video at the moment on evil and I think mm. people people tend to assume that evil if you believe in the existence of evil as such that it's this archaic idea they're like you know what are you in in the medieval ages you know evil um <laughs> but I mean even a even a cursory understanding of 20th century history can convince anyone you know unless they're not made of stone you know like yeah evil exists you know it's out there uh, the world is hell. <laughs> I, I kind of disagree with you here because yeah. I suppose it depends on our definition of evil. So when it comes down to it, for me, evil is is sort of intention, um, and I think even if people do terrible things, sometimes I think it can be born. Well, I think it is born of ignorance in in certain ways. So. Mm. Um, and I think, if I remember rightly, again, this is going back quite a long time now to my formal studies of philosophy. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like Nietzsche spoke about like evil and, yeah, I'm going to butcher this entirely, but it was something to do with evil being a term which um, slaves would use towards their owners mm. um, as, as a means of sort of like um, revenge or like satisfying the the injustice in the world no i think i know what you're talking about it's the um the master slave morality isn't it yeah that's right yeah that was yeah. it yeah because he was talking about um the genealogy of christianity where christian morals come from where western values come from and it was in um the yes. roman times where it's all coming back to me yeah now. all the formal studies are coming back <laughs> knocking around at the back of your head yeah um the the christians at this time were persecuted by the Romans and um, of course the Roman the Roman values were all like you know putting yourself first you should be courageous you should be brave you should be all these things you should grow yourself you know put yourself first and then the Christians because they were the, the slaves essentially in this master slave dynamic they, they were like well that stuff must be evil so 
let's have our values be um, you know temperance and kindness and turning the yes. other cheek and he was yes. like no 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 that's the wrong thing to believe you're, you're taking the slave mindset you should be taking the master mindset you should be putting yourself forward which was his big issue with Christianity yeah yeah okay um, you've explained it a lot yeah. better than I it's um I think it was <laughs> who else I think it was Anne Rand wrote about this as well oh yeah she wrote I think it was a, a book or an article or something on the the banality of evil so she was looking at all the um the Nuremberg trials of all the Nazis and she was looking at all these people all the all the Nazi um you know officers and everything and she didn't see evil people she just saw people that were doing what they were told you know and and that was all there is to it is it's not evil as such they were just they had orders and they followed them and, yeah. and anyone in that position would have done I, I'm not familiar with with that of of Ayn Rand, but it's that sounds exactly the same as as Milgram's experiment of the. Of yeah, the, do, uh, do you want to do you want to go into shocks. that a bit? Sure. I mean, we're going off skepticism a little bit here, but that's fine. Isn't oh, it? Yeah. Just meander into different stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, whilst we're on the subject of evil, I think Milgram was trying to which was thinking about whether those who did horrendous things in Nazi Germany were evil or had something different about their biological makeup or whether in fact it was down to something else and what he theorised was that it was that they were simply following orders um, and he ran an experiment uh, in which he got participants to slowly induce increasing voltages to to a person on the other side of the window um, again, it's a little more complex than that, but <laughs> essentially that was it. Um, yeah. And he found that, well, yeah, a key component to that actually was that Milgram himself was telling the participants to keep administering these shocks when, whenever they got a question wrong. And, and after a while, it became clear that the other person on the other side of the window was uh, in serious distress. But because Milgram was there sort of forcing him to, to press this button essentially not physically but you know mentally I guess he continued to or they would continue to, to press that button and essentially end up um, killing them in theory I think essentially he concluded from that that this this is what's causing a lot of the troubles in Germany at the time this is difficult because I don't know I don't know myself whether I'm defining evil as like an actual thing that exists out there in the world or mm. um, you know and th these are all valid points that evil people air quotes um, are just people following orders you know they're in the wrong place at the wrong time and I think it's difficult to say I, well it's easy to say now but um, I think it's it's difficult to say that were any of us in Nazi Germany at the time and we found ourselves being Nazi officers that we wouldn't have done the same. Yeah, and uh, I suppose I th it's context dependent. Yeah, it depends on a lot of things. You know, your upbringing and and the sort of um, your environment at the time. But um, yeah, I mean, as it turned out, a lot of people did buy into it, and a lot of people did, you know, buy into the sort of Nazi idea. I suppose. Yeah. Um, and it's it, you know, once you realise that, it's kind of scary, but it's it's worth knowing about yourself as a person. I think. Yeah. That you might be willing to do that. Yeah, well, I mean, if if people were willing to do it at the time, then that means that anyone at any time is capable of doing it as well. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I don't know whether I want to say evil exists, but I think it's definitely apparent that people have a massive capacity to cause others suffering uh, with a reason or without one. Um, yeah. Maybe we're defining evil differently here. But I think yeah. This is where I disagree. Is I think it's and any actions that that sort of cause suffering that way are born of sort of ignorance. Mm. Um, that's my general. That's my positive outlook. That's how I like to look at life, anyway. When you say when you say ignorance, what are you sort of defining that as? Um, a failure to to um, empathise with another person, for instance, or. Um, ignorance as to what you think is is right or um yeah just some sort of something's gone wrong in 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 the way that um they think about the world 
I but then that's subjective as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But then, what about those situations where uh, someone knows something's wrong and and they're aware that it's wrong and they know the consequences and then they do it anyway? Would that you know something sort of begging the question, but something that doesn't come out of ignorance? They're fully aware that it's wrong uh, and they fully intend to bring around bring about suffering to this person or this thing. You know, say someone's, you know, I know it's a bad thing to to kick this dog, but <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway because I want to. Yeah. Um, but if you, what so would for you... example, like a compulsion to to do something based on just raw physical desires, for instance, you know, your yeah. rage, um, violent yeah. attacks based on rage, for instance, is that is that what you mean? Yeah, I think that's hard to say. That comes from ignorance, but maybe I don't know if you've got another way to define yeah, it, but... or, or would you say that that's that's a, an evil action. That's, that's a good point. It doesn't come from ignorance, but I wouldn't say it comes from evil either. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have to think a bit more about that one. That's a hard one. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I forget how we came onto this topic. <laughs> I know, yeah. But um, I, was, I was watching a lecture recently on um, Cain and Abel, as it happens, and... I don't know. I wonder what you think of that then, because it's a very kind of an archetypal story. Um, you know, Abel's sacrifice is is favoured by God. Cain doesn't like it. Cain gets filled with jealousy and he becomes wrought. I think is the word in the Bible. Great word. Um, mm. And he just he clubs him to death with with a rock. I mean, what's what sort of action would you say that was? Yeah. Um... I don't, I don't want to get too much into other topics here, but it's mm. kind of um, this kind of goes into the whole idea around sort of deterministic theories and kind of how much you're in control of your own actions and these sorts of things. But, yeah, uh, that's I think a, just um, a whole other area which we shouldn't get into here. But <laughs> well, we could come back to it later because that's that's another example of uh, skepticism about the way our our lives are. Mm, um, okay, you know, okay. the illusion of free will and that. But we can we can talk about that later. Um, yeah. All right. So to come back to Descartes, um, go on then. Yeah. After after that, let's, fin- um, let's finish him off. Let's massive tangent. Off. Let's finish him off. So yeah, we've come from the dreaming thing. Um, we can't be certain that we're not dreaming right now. Uh, and his final wave of doubt, which is his most global wave of doubt, was that uh, massively famous. He hypothesized the existence of this um, evil demon, which which doesn't mean to say the evil demon exists, but because the possibility for it is there, he has to take it as true. Um, (laughs) You know, what if there's an evil demon that's deceiving me about everything all the time, even my capacity to use reason, which is a a massive step up from the other two. And you're kind of left there thinking like, oh, how do I know anything? Um, How do I know what I am? How do I know the external world exists? How how am I supposed to, how do I know I exist? You know, um, Mm. can, can the evil demon trick me into thinking that I exist when I don't? Yeah. And this is where the, um, as you mentioned, the Kagito comes in. So uh, he says, okay, so this demon might be able to trick me into thinking I exist when I don't, but is it possible to doubt the, um, or, or be skeptical about the, the fact that I exist? And Descartes says, well, no, because by the sheer act of doubting that you exist, that doubt infers or implies your existence. You yeah, can't, you can't, so, you can't uh, doubt and not exist. Yeah, exactly. So if there is an evil genius who's deceiving you, then that implies that there is something to deceive in the first place, right? Is that it? Yeah, basically. Yeah, and there's been yeah. there's been a bit of discussion throughout time about what the precise nature of the cogito is so the the proper formulation of the cogito is i am thinking therefore i exist yeah and he makes it clear that it's not a it's not supposed to be a syllogism which is uh you know premise premise conclusion it is i am thinking therefore i exist and from what people well from what i read from the meditations anyway he seems to sort of take it as a a transcendental argument something that's true just by thinking it or saying it, you know, whatever you say, I am, I exist, it sort of reaffirms the fact that, that you are actually a thing, you do exist, just by saying those words. 
Yeah. And I think maybe it's the maybe it's the only argument that's like that because I can't think of any others any other proofs that are true just by saying them. Can you can you go a bit further than that? I mean, again, I've I've not I've not um, studied this a long time now, and, and I, I know there was a lot of a variety of different um, rebuttals to that. Um, but can you go a bit further and say not I think, therefore I am, but something thinks, therefore something is. Yeah. So. And I think, and you can reduce it even more and say something exists. Like that is the. That's the sort of bare minimum you can you can expect. Yeah. So the the classic rebuttals, um, the one you brought up, as you said, you know, is Descartes says, "I am thinking." Well, who's the I? Is it you? Is it someone else? Is it a thing? Is it okay. a person? Yeah. Um, yeah. He never says what this I is, and oh, so yeah. you know you you can think you're you know everyone's got like a running uh, stream of consciousness in their mind at any one time. I know I do. <laughs> anyway talking incessantly in the background and um but yeah you know is it is it me that's doing that thinking how do i know it's me and then this sort of comes into the the humean thing um something we discussed briefly in the podcast with exerbia which is uh so hume says you can look inside yourself and you see you know you see a variety of thoughts and perceptions you can you can hear your inner monologue and you can uh you can you can look at things and you're aware that you're looking at things and how they feel qualitatively to you but no matter how hard you look into yourself you can never perceive a self that's not something that you can perceive inside your mind by introspection so it's not clear yeah. that the self actually exists yeah absolutely i don't i don't know if you're kind of um you've experimented all with meditation but that's kind of that's a very sort of direct way of kind of experiencing that and kind of dissolving the ego, I suppose, is one way to put yeah. it. Yeah. Um, um, I've done a bit of meditation. Um, and what was your, like, experience with that? Like, It's funny because you become very aware. I don't know if it's, if it's just me. It might be you as well. I become very aware when I'm meditating and, and focusing on breathing with that that I'm a I'm an embodied thing. I, I feel that I, I feel particularly embodied, you know, physical when yeah. I when I meditate. Um I don't know if that's the point. It's probably the opposite. You're supposed to be, be a passive recipient of things. Um There's 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 lots of different points to to the meditation, but um I, I suppose it kind of just it allows you to 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 bring awareness to yourself in a way which you don't have when you just have this classic stream of consciousness running all day. So I mean, ninety nine point nine percent of your life, you just you just in your own head. You know, you just thoughts are just running running around your head. But the point of meditation isn't to not think. The point is to observe when you when these thoughts arise, which is all the time. Right? Yeah, and if you sit there for half an hour or an hour and do that every couple of days or whatever you get really good at noticing when thoughts pop into your head and the sort of character of those thoughts whether they're positive or negative or you know this sort of thing so I mean train, it trains you to focus for a start but it also trains you to um, start to watch your own thoughts and then doing that you can separate yourself from your thoughts it's real, it's real strange yeah so that's something to talk about um if the point of meditation is to separate you know we can say separate the thoughts from the thinker um what exactly is it that descartes manages to prove with the cogito is it that the that the thinker exists or that there are there are thoughts just sort of floating in the void that uh make up the idea of him as a person yeah i think that's that's the very least it proves, isn't it? Yeah. It yeah. It's not like you can't entirely disprove Descartes here, I don't think, can you? Like fully. No. You can reduce it even more and say really it's just he's only proven that something exists, that yeah. something is thinking, that something you know. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's the second um that's the second reduction you can make is um do thoughts need a thinker? Which yeah. which is one of those sort of um questions that you'll say to someone who doesn't study philosophy and they'll be like why do you take this subject <laughs> you know <laughs> where's the utility in that um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah i mean it's I mean, a, it's, actually, a... <laughs> it's quite dry as well i mean like 
this I haven't I haven't looked at this stuff in years just because like the whole like rashness and empiricist stuff I kind of I was like I'm done with this like I know it now like, I, I don't I don't want to go over it again yeah <laughs> so like I can't I just think about like I'm more into like existentialist philosophy nowadays it's yeah kind of what I look at but yeah but yeah it's uh oh god bringing back terrible memories Mr. Verse <laughs> I think only at the bare minimum he manages to prove that he and just him is some you know non-physical thoughts floating in a void that may or may not be getting tricked on by an evil demon <laughs> yeah. which isn't much but um this is where Descartes gets a bit sneaky because he does this little sleight of hand and he says well the cogito is clearly and distinctly true that was his sort of uh, his mantra when going about this project. And and <laughs> final word, it's done, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it is. It is one of those things where you listen to it and it just thinks, yeah, that does make sense. Um, at least at the bare minimum level. So he's managed to prove he exists in some form. Fair enough. But then what he does is he says, okay, well, anything else I perceive clearly and distinctly must be true as well. And. Uh, he says, well, I can clearly and distinctly know that God exists. And it's like, mm, maybe not. I wouldn't yeah, go that far. Yeah. And then it's it's because God exists that then he can say, well, I know that the evil demon doesn't exist because God is good and God wouldn't deceive me like that. And then he can sort yeah, of... That's another weird assumption. He, he sort of, you know, funnily enough, he, he builds up his picture of the world the same as it was before, but free of any doubt. And that was his sort of, his goal there was one analogy that I like was um, he picks out um, the rotten apples from the fruit basket and uh, he's got his certainty and the scientific method from, can uh, can kick off from there because the, the fundamental assumptions about the world he knows now with absolute certainty are true I think he kind of goes full circle doesn't he he does he goes to yeah. all, he goes to all, saying that basically nothing is you can tell basically nothing. Yeah. And then he goes full circle and then, and then assumes a bunch of stuff on top of that. Well, that was the, um, just talking yeah. of circularity, the um, the Cartesian circle, the massive flaw in his thinking that people have since outlined is... Um, What's that? So he says that God exists. And he's like, yeah, okay. How do you know God exists? And he says, well, I can clearly and distinctly perceive it's true. And you can say, well, how do you know that what you clearly and distinctly perceive is true? Well, God exists, so, <laughs> and and he just goes round and round and round in a yeah. circle, and it's like, well, you haven't really proved a lot, um, only that he exists in some form, and yeah. that's the problem with global skepticism, like Descartes does. He doubts everything he possibly can, is that you can never resolve it once you've once you've got that doubt, you can always be skeptical, and I mean, yeah, granted, it does take a bit of a metaphysical leap of faith shall we say um to believe anything is true because once you have the seeds of global doubt you know sort of sown in your mind you can't rid yourself completely of it um yeah i suppose that kind of paves the way a little bit into sort of the the, the scientific method we have now in a way right yeah so i think like pop pop is a good example in that he sort of uh defines science as having to be something which you like a theory that you have to falsify rather than um, something which you confirm to be true with evidence mm. accumulating sort of thing. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best teacher or explainer of things, yeah. but that's kind of it, isn't it? I think, I mean, what do you think? Do you think falsification is a good uh, metric for generating knowledge? In terms of what's definitely true, yeah, that absolutely makes sense. It's impossible to verify something's true, but it is possible to falsify it. You know, I could make a claim that there's a, you know, an invisible, intangible rabbit on my desk or something. You can never verify that, but you can know with, um, like, reasonable certainty that it's that it's not. Yeah, yeah. There, there was something I read. I can't remember if it was related to the scientific method or not, but it was. Uh, I think it was Bertrand Russell, and he said. Um, Oh, you know, there's a there's a teacup floating in space between Earth and Mars. Yeah, so that's that's the floating teapot theory, isn't it? So I think that was 
that was in relation to God. So he was saying that um, I can claim something like there's there's a floating teapot orbiting the Earth, and you can't see it and you can't perceive it, but it's there. Yeah. Um, and because you can't you can't falsify it. Well, he he he's basically saying that this type of knowledge is trash, basically, because you because you can't falsify it, so it's something you can't assert. Yeah. And he made the analogy to God, in that you can't just say, "Well, I perceive it. I, I think it's there. So yeah, I believe it's there. If it's unfalsifiable, then it's a it's a non-starter as an argument kind of thing." Yeah, that was it. Like the um, like the rubber on my desk, I could I could posit it's there, and you could never falsify it. So it's yeah, you can't really get anywhere with that sort of um. There's just nothing to do about it, is there? You, you, I could say anything exists, um, but if it's unfalsifiable yeah. in principle, then you can you can never know anything about it. It's 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 sort of a a nothing theory, isn't it? Yeah. So um, again, I think Popper sort of highlighted the difference between a, a scientific theory in that respect. In that, say, like uh, the theory of like gravity, right? You can test that again and again. Yeah. And you you but you you try and falsify that. But something uh, like making a, a vague theory on, you know, how society works as a as an organism or whatever, mm. you can find evidence for that all over the place. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. But if you can predict the way society is going to behave, then that is something which is falsifiable because then you can just observe whether that prediction comes true or not, sort of thing. Mm. Again, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not doing the best explanation of this but yeah um but that is sort of one incantation of the sort of skeptical method of of um how we sort of like acquire knowledge i guess isn't it this is the scientific method and i suppose that brings it back to um <laughs> how the apparent lack of progress in philosophy because a lot of the things in philosophy especially metaphysics are unfalsifiable um there's not things that that we can know with uh, with any sort of certainty, um, yeah. and that's where this is the problem I have with philosophy. A lot of the time yeah. is that I, I, there's so many philosophers who I find their ideas appealing, and then I realise they actually they contradict each other. But because they're unfalsifiable, I can still like all of them. Yeah, <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it? Well, this is the sort of um, anti-representationalist view, isn't it? That we can have fundamentally different ways of viewing the world and they're all sort of true so we could have you know we can have a, a scientific worldview that's just as valid as a religious one that's just as valid as a poetic one um and they're all sort of true um yeah i hate that i hate that that's that's the case but you're right yeah you're mm. right that is the case but also it kind of that opens a door for you to change your mind on things and to change your opinion on the way the world works and in, in quite dramatic ways over over time you know mm. um and uh i mean i'm i think i'm a bit older than you but i've changed my mind radically on certain things over the years and i kind of look forward to in 10 20 30 years where i'll be then and what what i'll be thinking what i'll believe then you know yeah it's sort of a continual process isn't it because you can't expect yeah, you can't expect anyone to um to know everything at the outset so it's sort of impossible to make a um i don't know at least for me it's impossible to have uh, a concrete belief in something that you you absolutely know is true because you don't know all the facts so how are you supposed mm. to arrive at a conclusion when you don't have all the available um data that you need to make that belief yeah it it seems to be quite closely related to age as well so like you know the amount of people who I who I knew when I was like 15 or 20 or something who would say things like I'm just going to live as as best I can whilst I'm young and then I'll just kill myself when I get to the age of 60 because I won't I won't, I won't want to live past that anyway so yeah. I'll just go mad and like and ruin my body now and I just think well, what happens when you actually reach 60 and you're, you're not going to feel the same no um, another example would be how people gradually go from liberalism in, in their youth to conservatism as they get older. Yeah, that's always fascinated it's, me. It's closely linked with age, isn't it? Yeah. These, this, the sorts of these, your your sort of philosophy, philosophy in a, in a broader sense of the word on life. It's kind of it's it's very closely linked to where you are in your life. Yeah. 
Um, and you can kind of predict where your own mind's going to go as well, you know? Yeah. Strangely. Yeah, it's a weird thing. But then I suppose this is why um, people should engage in the philosophical method because that's how you would come to arrive at uh, knowledge and, and become more secure in your beliefs is by by talking to other people like, well, like we're doing now and, mm. um, you know, disagreeing and making criticisms and things because you're not expected to, nor can you have all the facts at any one time about um, your beliefs. And at some point it's it's got to be a sort of leap of faith because you know human lives they're um they're finite uh, we don't live forever so we're never going to have all the facts um unless you're like uh, the faust or something and uh you know things are going to change over time necessarily so there's always going to have to be a leap of faith in there somewhere at least that's what i think anyway i suppose the other problem with the scientific method or it, or or any of it actually is like the assertions that theories are built on so do you know thomas kuhn is it thomas kuhn i'm not sure right yes yeah. so he was a guy that talks about different paradigms in in science and about how there's sort of certain paradigmatic shifts that go on over time um for example um newton's theory of what was it what was what was newton <laughs> uh, <laughs> which was gravity sort of, yeah was it gravity yeah i think yeah so. and then that was sort of surpassed by Einstein's theory but before Einstein everyone had based their own theories on Newton's theories of gravity so yeah you know so <clears throat> any knowledge that we do have on on anything either in science or any other field it's going to be based on a range of assumptions which we take for granted yeah and this was this was sort of Descartes project to make sure that his assumptions were at least justified in some sense yeah, even if they couldn't yeah, be justified fully. Yeah, those assumptions from the ground, right, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, from the ground up. And this is where, you know, you get the sort of anti-representationalist um, postmodern viewpoints where there is no consensus. And I wonder if we did, like, don't question me on postmodernism because I haven't got a clue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if if we did live in a sort of postmodern society and everyone took that, for granted um if any science was was even possible because if there's no one set of facts that we can uh, prefer over the other if if there's an infinite number of ways of reading into the nature of reality and they're all equally valid um how are you supposed to generate any knowledge from that it seems like a sort of non-starter yeah i I don't delve too much in postmodernism. It kind of muddies the waters of knowledge a little bit, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It kind of, uh, you know, if you think I'm talking gibberish now, then if I try and get into postmodernism, then it won't make any sense. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things that are best avoided. <laughs> um, I don't know where we can go from here, really. <laughs> same. Um, That's such a testament to postmodernism that it just kills a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um So what so you're you're a a philosophy student, aren't you? Yeah. So have you found that learning these different ways to to think has has sort of helped you in any way in thinking about other ideas aside from philosophy sort of thing? Um I can definitely say it's helped me um it's given me the tools with which to prod and poke at the assumptions I take for granted. Yeah, it's, okay. Because I think that's what's unique about philosophy um, as a humanity and sort of as a subject in its own right. Um, it gives you the tools with which to think. Exactly, yeah. And that's why I don't regret <laughs> my degree in doing that at all because it's, it's served me well throughout life so and I think the, the reason why scepticism is, is important in this is because I, I naturally sort of go to that, that kind of method of thinking just placing doubt into any idea so this is where I think scepticism can come in, in into a variety of different areas right so like when we said about doing this podcast I was like well actually I realise that 
I use skepticism or like the idea of casting doubt on things on a daily basis about everything. Yeah. Um, not interested in philosophy. So um, I think it's kind of a, a really useful tool um, on a grander scale, I suppose. Yeah. It's, um, I think it's important because, um, I mean, we, it goes all the way back to Plato. Um, all of Plato's books, they weren't just philosophical texts as you'd read today, like really dry articles and that. Um, they were they were dialogues. They were all named after people. And it was Socrates, usually Socrates, talking to someone and they'd engage in a discussion. It's an important factor of knowledge because I don't think any one person could come up with or sort through mentally all the facts they need to come up with a, a concrete distinction because there's always going to be biases on your part and there's going to be stuff that other people know that you don't and I think a, a dialogue in, in, in line with the um, Socratic method is really important in discovering what um, what your beliefs are made of and what the assumptions are yeah and, and what you think I do wonder whether I'll sort of go throughout my life and just keep flip-flopping between theories and ideas that I like more <laughs> do you know yeah. that kind of concerns me a little bit that I that I'm that I'm too much of a skeptic in a way and that I'll just discard idea after idea and after idea and I'll be left confused you know yeah um, is that something that concerns you like yeah it's definitely a problem well like we were saying earlier that um it's never good to be too skeptical about things because it's just unhelpful at some stages like yeah it's all well and good for Descartes to invoke this evil demon that might be deceiving him about everything he knows um but if you can never fully get rid of that like the brain in a vat example is the other one um you know you can never be sure you're not just a brain in a vat yeah. with an evil scientist tinkering with your perceptions feeding you things that you think are real um it's all well and good to entertain those ideas but at the end of the day they're not gonna help you in any sense uh discover truth for yourself or discover knowledge um no it, it, it will at the very least considering those ideas that will drive you mad like the brain the vat or like the simulation theory or at least give you reason to sort of be humble in your assertions yeah right? yeah i think that's a lot of um especially buddhist teachings but i think it's becoming more popular that the opinion that um you know we don't know everything and and that's a scary thing because there's a lot more that we don't know than than what we know um but i think you should take it with um humility and be be humble about the things that you don't know about because uh i think that leads to greater sort of fulfillment and happiness in your life knowing that there's a lot of stuff that you don't know it sort of puts you in your place and you think you know huh, i'm just a really small small thing an important thing don't get me wrong because you're you're you and and you're important to you and to other people but i think it's always good to maintain a healthy skepticism about the things that you think you know otherwise you get cocky and you get arrogant yeah it's it, you need to balance it don't you yeah that's the thing this is this is why it's I, good to to talk with other people because you're never going to hear alternate viewpoints if all you you hear is yourself and you 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 constantly back up your own ideas and it's like well, yeah, of course you're going to back up your own ideas. They're your ideas. Um, and you're never going to get anywhere further than that if you don't chat with other people and engage in this philosophical method, even a scientific method, to to try and falsify your belief, to see if there's anything wrong with them, to make you realise that, um, you know, I really don't know everything and there's there's more out there to discover and there's more work to be done. Yeah. I suppose it's kind of... Being sceptic is, is a way of like sharpening the tools, you know, it, it, engaging in conversations with people who you feel you feel is wrong about something and trying to pick pick holes in it. That's kind of just, I suppose that's kind of de debate, isn't it, really, rather than... Yeah. Um, I mean... Philosophy this, is kind of the art of debating. This is why um, Plato in particular was so um, angry and upset about... Um, sophistry in particular because you know they're great debaters the sophists and in ancient greece you, right. you'd pay them or and, and they'd um 
they, they'd convince you about anything using rhetoric and they'd use language to convince you of a point that isn't necessarily true but that's what they're using that's their skill is rhetoric they know how to talk and they know how to convince people um, yeah. but that's no good if you want to find truth and you want to live yeah. according to what's true rather than thinking you're right when actually you're wrong yeah it's hard isn't it it's hard it is hard but um, there's a great quote from uh, David Hume that I'll paraphrase he says um, skepticism is like coleslaw he says uh, it's alright on the side of your meal but you wouldn't want any, a whole meal of just coleslaw um, <laughs> <laughs> that can't be right did he really say that yeah he did yeah I'm pretty sure it was him yeah <laughs> but I mean, it's, it, it's true whether it, whether he said it or not. Actually, do you know what? I think I've heard a similar quote from Hume. Now I think about it, but not with the colourful coleslaw metaphor. Yeah, <laughs> it was something like, "Be a philosopher, but amidst all that, still be a man." No, yeah, that's a good quote because, um, you know, as philosophers, they like to think that they. Um, they know everything they've got a direct sort of pipeline to the truth at least some of them do um Descartes definitely did and uh I think it's nice to know that you know you're a man you're limited there's there's stuff that you don't know and there's stuff that you're never going to know and um all we can try and do really in our lives is um keep working towards knowing more than we do today um you know learning more about the world tomorrow than we know right now and all we can do is sort of edge closer to the truth. Yeah, but that's the thing. Can we do that? And this is what I was saying about being almost too sceptical and discarding ideas too quickly. And back again to Kuhn's uh, paradigm idea, you know, if the whole structure of your reality breaks down, I mean, it's, it's quite enlightening when you change your opinion so radically, but can you keep doing that forever, like throughout your whole life? Mm. Because if you get to the point where you're old and you realise your mind has been continuously changing perspective for so long, I imagine it's quite unsettling. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think it can be a comforting thing. Um, I mean, it can be a source of massive existential anxiety um, on the one hand, but it, it can be nice to know that um, you know that there is no. Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. But for all we know, there's no one set of facts out there that's true with a capital T, you know, at least nothing that we can get at with our current science and understanding anyway. Um, but just to to take in all the, all the information we get, all the information we can, um, and just to do what we can with it. We can only do what we can do. Um, and it's, it's just, yeah, like you were saying, it's, it's a balance really. Yeah, it's a hard one to strike even if we can never arrive at proper truth um it was just like socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living and i think the be the best we can hope for is just to take all the information in talk to different people weigh it up measure it and um go for as best as we can with our current knowledge yeah at least that makes life interesting and just trying to explore different ideas yeah just makes life worthwhile in itself i guess yeah i mean it wouldn't be any fun if we had all the answers would it it would it would be boring it would you know there's no sort of uh point to living that way if, if all the answers are just given to us yeah i don't know if any of your followers know my uh twitter account but it's mostly an account which posts quotes all right so over the years yeah. i've sort of realized what people like most in terms of quotes and consistently, one of the most popular quotes on there is the unexamined life isn't worth living. And I think that speaks depths, you know, like I think people must just see that and think, yeah, you know. And, yeah. and I also pity people who really don't think about these things and just go about their daily lives in their own heads. And I think that just speaks depth of just about how important philosophy can be and how useful skepticism can be as a way of like navigating mm. the world and trying to sort of find your own truths yeah it's um i don't think anyone can say that philosophy is completely useless 
I mean, I might, I might end up working in a in a Costa Coffee with my degree yet, but um, at, at least I'll be able to organise my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, this has been a great conversation. Thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, I apologise for <laughs> stuttering so much on my part. My knowledge is not in depth <laughs> on any of this stuff, but I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Actually, you're a oh well, thank you. You're a good host and uh, and good conversation as well. Well, thank you. Same to you. And keep up all the other content as well. It's good and uh, keep up these podcasts. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I'll I'll try and keep them on going as long as I can. Anyone listening want to um jump on the podcast? Then uh, get in touch. Yeah. Yeah, it's been good fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone listening, definitely check out Philosophy on Ice's channel. Um get him to a thousand subscribers uh yeah <laughs> perhaps i'll do like a, a drunken ama at a thousand subscribers that sounds fantastic yeah i'll just get real drunk and do an ama <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely be there for that just very unacademic yeah like my channel uh well thank you very much man appreciate it buddy yeah cheers see you later see ya.